How to draw Lewis dot structure is going to be the topic of this lesson, and it is going to be a comprehensive lesson. It'll be a little bit long, I'm going to warn you, because uh, we're going to make sure that you get a chance to look at every little nuance of every little rule possible for drawing these Lewis structures. We're going to talk about the octet rule. We're going to talk about the three major exceptions to the octet rule, including expanded octets. Uh, we're going to talk about resonance structures for those that have resonance. We'll talk about formal charges and how we can use formal charge to distinguish between some of these resonant structures. Uh, we are going to work a ton of examples, uh, and this is super important. This is foundational for the entire uh, next chapter as well, which is going to deal with like molecular geometry. So you really got to have a good handle on these Lewis dot structures for any of that to really make sense. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You can find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year. It covers an entire year of general chemistry. And if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, then subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so we got to talk about Lewis dot structures. and. Uh, Lewis dot structure is just a way of representing the valence electrons, and if you recall, the valence electrons are the outermost shell, uh, and the reason they get their own special name, so everything closer than the valence is just called cord, you know, regardless of what shell they're in, but the outermost shell gets its own special name, distinguishing it from everything else, uh, the valence, because they are the ones involved in chemical reactions, in the making and breaking of bonds. And so uh, we're going to see that sometimes these electrons are shared uh, and things of this sort, and we will draw that as a covalent bond. Now, in the last lesson, we dealt with ionic bonding, and we are going to deal just a smidge with ionic bonding in this lesson, but it's mostly going to be about covalent bonding and representing molecules with these Lewis dot structures. So just as a reminder for the number of valence electrons in an atom. So uh, on the periodic table here, your group one metals have one valence electron. Your group two metals have two valence electrons. Your group three elements here, uh, or group 13, depending on which convention you're using, have three valence electrons. Carbon's group four valence electrons. Nitrogen's group five valence electrons. Oxygen's group six valence electrons. The halogen seven valence electrons. And the noble gas is eight val valence electrons, except for helium, which just has two. Now, one thing to note, because we are really going to be heavily focusing on molecular compounds, which are made up of mostly nonmetals, we are mostly going to be dealing with these elements right up here. So yeah, I said that the group one metals, the alkali metals have one valence electron, and that'll be relevant for like two minutes at the beginning of this lesson. And then we probably just won't talk about metals much at all through the rest. So I'm not saying they're completely unimportant, but this lesson's heavily going to focus on the nonmetals as we make molecular compounds here. So but we will start with something that does have sodium, and sodium is a group one metal, and it has one valence electron. And the way this works, since uh, atoms uh, can typically have up to eight valence electrons uh, in most cases, we're going to split those up that you can draw them as dots on four different sides of an atom. So, and you put one on each side before you start pairing them up. Well, in sodium's case, it just got one. And it doesn't matter if you put it on the top or the bottom or the left or the right. So, and I'm just going to put it on the right here. And there's his one valence electron. Now, chlorine, on the other hand, being a halogen, has got seven valence electrons. And so, in this case, we're going to put one on each side and then start pairing them up as well. And so these three sides each have a pair, and then this one's just got that uh, unpaired electron right there. And so these dots represent the electrons. Cool. Now, in the case of a metal and a non-metal, so we'll find out that uh, uh, the electrons are going to organize themselves in such a way that everybody gets what's called a filled octet. And we call this the octet rule. And so in one way, shape, or form, atoms are either going to transfer electrons, in the case of a metal and a non-metal, which would be ionic bonding, or they're going to share electrons, as we see two nonmetals doing over here, in an attempt to get these filled octets to feel like it has eight valence electrons in its outermost shell. So, uh, in the case again of a metal and a nonmetal, you've got a metal with a low ionization energy, you've got a nonmetal with a rather high, i.e., very negative electron affinity, and so the transfer of electrons makes sense here. And so, in this case, so we are just going to transfer an electron over from sodium over to chlorine in order to satisfy this octet rule. All 
And so effectively, chlorine has just stolen sodium's electron. And that's gonna leave chlorine with a negative one charge and sodium with a positive one charge. And uh, sodium is not exactly upset with chlorine, though, that, that chlorine stole his electron because now sodium's positive and chlorine is negative. And sodium's like, well, chlorine's kind of cute, actually. And so they're gonna hang out together having opposite charges. That's kind of the, the nature of an ionic bond. And so, uh, for ionic bonds, we don't actually draw a line between the metal and the non-metal or anything like this. We'll find out that drawing a line like that specifically designates a covalent bond. So ionic bond is just by nature of having a plus charge and a minus charge, a cation and an anion. All right, so what if we've just got two non-metals now? And once again, these have got seven valence electrons each. And so they both have a problem. They're both one short uh, of having a filled octet. And in this case, you know, the chlorine on the left here tells the other chlorine, hey, give me your electron. And this chlorine says, no, you give me your electron. And so the problem is that neither one of them has a low ionization energy like sodium. And so neither one is going to relatively easily lose an electron. They, in fact, both want to gain an electron. And that's kind of the predicament you're in when you've got two nonmetals is uh, you've got nobody who can easily lose an electron, nobody with a low ionization energy. And so with the nonmetals, that's why we're going to share electrons in an attempt to get a filled octet. And so what we're going to do is share each of these guys one of these electrons in the middle. And so we can write this a couple of different ways. We can put those shared electrons right in the middle. So, and now we've got a couple of different designations here. The ones that are being shared are called bonding electrons. So we've got two bonding electrons. And then the ones out here are called non-bonding electrons. They're not being shared in any way, shape, or form. And so these non-bonding electrons are often called lone pairs as well. So these lone pairs of electrons, this chlorine on the left has three lone pairs of electrons or three lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. And the one on the right's got three lone pairs of non-bonding electrons as well. And generally, bonding electrons are gonna be lower in energy than non-bonding electrons. And that's the whole nature of why these uh, atoms are gonna bond together. So by having bonding electrons, whereas before they just had other non-bonding electrons, they weren't being used to make a bond before. So in coming together though, it lowers the energy of their electrons. And that is what is the driving factor in forming a bond. It's an uh, exothermic process for uh, making a bond, as we'll find out, it would be an endothermic process to break the bond. So, but it's energetically favorable to make bonds. All right, so another way we can represent those shared electrons, though, and quite commonly what we'll do is we'll draw a line to represent those bonding electrons. And so that line represents a covalent bond, just like the two dots in between the two chlorines also represented a covalent bond. So, but here, uh, just another way of drawing it, but you're supposed to see that every line right there, every bond in this case, every covalent bond specifically, represents two electrons. And we'll find out that in some cases we'll have double bonds and triple bonds where we'll end up having more than just two shared electrons. We could have four shared electrons, which would be a double bond, or six shared electrons, which would be a triple bond. So when we'll find out, you know, how do you know when you need a double bond or a triple bond? Well, we'll have some rules for drawing Lewis structures that'll help us figure exactly that out. Now, we talked about this octet rule, and now we've seen its utility in predicting structures, either the transfer of electrons for an ionic compound to you know, have both getting a filled octet. Notice chlorine here's got two, four, six, eight around it. And sodium, by giving one away, it's got its previous second shell still full. And so he's got a filled octet as well. And same thing here with these chlorines, both of them get to count the shared electrons. So the chlorine on the left says, I've got two, four, six, eight. And this chlorine on the right says, I've got two, four, six, eight. And everybody is happy, i.e. everybody's got a filled octet. Now you should know that there are three major exceptions to the octet rule. And so one, not everybody follows the octet rule. Some are gonna go under the octet rule. And if you recall, we talked about helium at the beginning of this lesson that uh, is the only noble gas here that does not have eight valence electrons, it just has two. So, and so if you drew the Lewis structure for helium, he would not be getting a filled octet. He would be full in his case. The first shell only has that one S orbital, and so it can only hold two electrons, but it's kind of the exception to the rule, right? So, but hydrogen is therefore going to be the same case then. Hydrogen, in order to be full, wants to look like its nearest noble gas, which is helium. And so as a result, hydrogen really only wants to have two electrons around him, not eight as the case may be. So, whereas if you take a look at something like, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, generally each of those are gonna be found following the octet rule most of the time. So, but not hydrogen. Hydrogen's never gonna follow the octet rule. When hydrogen's full, it just has two electrons. 
Now, one other thing we should realize is that uh, uh, we're going to run into some issues here with beryllium and boron and aluminum as well. And uh, one thing you should realize, first of all, is that beryllium is somewhat metallic and aluminum is fairly metallic. And we're like, um, they don't really form molecules. Yeah, they're not, they don't form molecular compounds because metals and nonmetals form ionic compounds. And again, in the last lesson, we kind of looked at some examples, or in the first lesson in this chapter, we looked at some examples uh, where the electronegativity difference really is a better measure of whether we have ionic or covalent bonding going on. It turns out uh, aluminum and beryllium actually can be involved in covalent bonding. Now it's gonna be polar covalent bonding, but it's still gonna be covalent bonding. And so it is appropriate for us to talk about them a little bit uh, in this context. And so uh, it turns out beryllium here has two valence electrons. And the way this works is typically he's gonna share one with one atom and then share one with another atom. And in the process, make two bonds. So in the case of sharing here, like the chlorines here, both atoms are typically going to contribute one electron each to share and that's what forms a bond. And so with beryllium having two valence electrons, he shares one with one atom over here, he shares the other with another atom over here, and then he's out of electrons and he can't make any more bonds. And so at that point, beryllium would just be bonded to atom, you know, two other atoms, and I'll just call them atom X at this point, uh, on either side and end up with only a total of four electrons around him. And so he's not gonna get, be able to get a filled octet. He just doesn't have enough electrons to share. And so in the case of beryllium, he's only gonna want four electrons to be full in a typical sense. And then boron and aluminum will follow a similar thing. So uh, boron and aluminum both have three valence electrons and so they can share with three different atoms. And so in this case, we might share with atom X there and atom X there and atom X there. And at that point, so boron's kicking in one electron, atom X, whatever it is, kicking in an electron, and boron's out of electrons. He can't make a fourth bond. He has nothing left to donate or contribute to make that bond. And so boron's gonna be left with two, four, six electrons around him to be full. And so it's pretty typical for boron and aluminum to therefore have six electrons rather than a filled octet. Now, it turns out that boron aluminum can be found with a filled octet. It's just, uh, they don't have to be. M much more commonly gonna be found with six. So in fact, we can take this a step further. We can actually predict the normal number of bonds an atom is going to make. And usually it's about how many electrons they're short from being full, which again, usually means a filled octet. So, but again, we've got this octet rule and it says that, uh, again, hydrogen might only get two, not eight. Beryllium is typically only gonna get four to be full, not eight. And then boron aluminum typically six to be full and not eight as well. So that's your first exception to the octet rule. Your second exception to the octet rule is what we call an expanded octet. It's atoms that go over the octet rule and you, you kinda gotta realize where the octet rule comes from first. And the octet rule comes from the fact that a typical shell of electrons is gonna have a single s orbital and then three p orbitals. And you can put a maximum of eight electrons in that outermost shell. Well, as you guys well know from chapter six, there's not just S orbitals and P orbitals, there's also D orbitals and F orbitals. But you only start getting those D orbitals in shell number three, and you only start getting those F orbitals in shell number four. And so it turns out only for elements that are, you know, have their valence in shell number three or higher, so which is gonna end up meaning uh, in the third row of the periodic table or lower, only those can potentially throw some electrons in the D orbitals as well. And so you got room to fit 10 more uh, potentially and stuff like that for these d orbitals. But again, there's no such thing as a 1d orbital or a 2d orbital. The first time we ever see the d orbitals is in shell number three. And so it's only for these elements in shell number three here, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, or below that can exceed this octet rule. And so uh, you should know though, they don't have to exceed the octet rule, have this expanded octet, but they can. And so we'll find out that fairly commonly, sulfur can be found making two bonds, just like oxygen, and we'll explain why that is in a minute. And with two bonds and two lone pairs, it would follow the octet rule. However, it's not uncommon to see sulfur making like six bonds, uh, in which case that would be 12 electrons and he's definitely going over the octet rule. So, whereas oxygen doesn't have that capability. In the second period here, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, there are no two D orbitals. There's only S's and P's, and so they are limited at eight electrons. Uh, in that second period. So it's only when they get to the end of that third period and below that you can have this expanded octet. Now finally, the third exception and the rarest of the three for that octet rule is if you just simply have an odd number of electrons. And the most common example is NO. 
So, and if we look here, nitrogen's got five valence electrons right here, whereas oxygen's got six valence electrons. And so it turns out that NO would have a total of 11 valence electrons. Well, the problem is, is you can't have these all existing in pairs when you have an odd number of electrons. And so there's no way for both atoms to say they both have eight, an even number, if you have an odd number total. And so there's no way this is going to satisfy the octet rule, and we'll, we'll see an example of that at some point in time. So, but that's the least common example, having an odd number of electrons, and typically what you'll end up doing is preferentially giving electrons to the more electronegative atom first, as we'll see. So now that we've got the octet rule and all three notable exceptions uh, down, we're just going to start following the rules for drawing Lewis structures, and we're just going to work our way through examples. Best way to learn these rules is to actually apply them in a variety of examples. Okay, so I hinted at this earlier, but the octet rule also allows us to kind of imply how many bonds an atom is normally going to make to get that filled octet. So if we take a look at the halogens here, the halogens here have seven valence electrons, and so they're only one shy of having a filled octet. And so what they're going to really need to do is just share one bond with an atom. That way they chip in an electron, the other atom will chip in an electron, and they'll get to credit that other electron as being theirs now, now they'd have eight. And so you can kind of look at how many electrons are they short from being full, which again usually means filled octet, and that's usually how many covalent bonds you'll find it making. So the halogens, being just one electron shy of a filled octet, you'll normally find them making just one bond. So the chalcogens here, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, being two electrons short of a filled octet of a noble gas configuration, are typically going to be found making two bonds. So nitrogen's column here with uh, five valence electrons, that's three electrons short of a filled octet, and so they're generally going to be ma found making three bonds uh, to get a filled octet. Carbon and silicon here, germanium, they are, uh, have four valence electrons, that means they're four electrons short of a filled octet and will be most often found making four bonds to get that filled octet. Now, if you recall, boron and aluminum were exceptions, so they have three valence electrons, but they're not trying to get a filled octet. In fact, you can't make more than four bonds uh, in the case of boron here, uh, unless you're going to have, again, an expanded octet. Again, the period two elements can't have that expanded octet. So, but for boron and aluminum, they're usually trying to get just six electrons to be full, not eight. And as a result, with three valence electrons, they're just three short of being full and are going to be typically found making three bonds. Over at beryllium here, so beryllium's got two valence electrons, and again, he's not trying to get a filled octet, he's usually just trying to be full at four total electrons, and so having two, he's just too short, and therefore you can predict that he'd typically be found making two bonds, and that's true. Now the reason this is important uh, is it's got some, some explanatory power, so we are typically going to have a central atom in most of the molecules we're going to look at, and with the atom in the middle is going to be the one that's bonded to everything else around it, and so typically the one in the middle is going to be the one that can generally make the most bonds. And now that we know how many bonds things make, we can kind of, you know, got some predictive power here. So the way this generally works, and, and they often the way it's presented, is that the least electronegative element, and again, reminder that fluorine is the most electronegative element on the predict table, generally the least electronegative element is the one that can make the most bonds and would therefore go in the middle of the molecule. Now, you need to realize that hydrogen is going to be an exception here, because hydrogen's less electronegative than, say, carbon, but hydrogen's only going to make one bond. It's got one valence electron, it only wants two total, so it's only going to make one bond. And so don't put, hydrogen's never going to be a central atom. So usually the least electronegative atom but not hydrogen, is going to be in the center. Now, it also works that way as you go up a group and stuff like that as well, it turns out. So if you've got more than one halogen in a molecule, it's usually the bigger one that's less electronegative that's going to be in the middle, not the smaller one. So just something to keep in mind here. So if we say the least electronegative element goes in the middle, except not hydrogen, that usually will suffice to, to get you there. And the idea is that the one in the middle needs to make the most bonds, so we need to put the one in the middle that can make the most bonds. All right, so if we take a look at CCl4 here, the chlorines can each just make one bond each, usually, so is what we'll find. Uh, again, they have an, a chance of having an expanded octet, so we can't, you know, rule that out completely, but it's typically not going to be the case. We'll find out to, to have an expanded octet, chlorine needs to be that central atom, and he's not going to be in this case. But the chlorines usually make one bond, carbon can make four four bonds with four valence electrons. Carbon is also much less electronegative, and so we're going to put carbon in the middle. And so the first thing you want to do is set up a skeleton for your molecule. And so I'm going to put carbon in the middle, in the middle, in the middle and we're going to connect him to 
those four chlorines. So he's the central atom and these guys are on the outside. We've now drawn in eight shared electrons, i.e. four bonds. So, and then we've got our skeleton set up. So next thing you want to do is fill up the octets of all the outside atoms first. And so assuming they want a filled octet, and in this case, the chlorines do, they're not any of the uh, exceptions that go under the octet rule like hydrogen, beryllium, or boron. And so we're just going to fill them up. You'll always have enough electrons to fill them up. So we set up our skeleton, put the least electronegative atom in the middle. So it filled up the outside atoms octets. And from this time, we now need to take an accounting. And usually what we'll actually do is count up the valence electrons that are gonna be in our structure before we actually even get started. So, but in this case, uh, the only the electrons that show up in your Lewis dot structure, again, are those valence electrons. So pretty good idea if, if you just figure out how many you've got to begin with. So we've got four for carbon. We've got seven for each of the four chlorines. Four times seven is 28, plus the four for carbon gets us 32 valence electrons. And so once you fill up those outside atoms, you gotta ask yourself a question, is do you have any electrons, valence electrons specifically left to go? Well, in our case, we got two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So that's eight times four is indeed 32, and we are out of electrons. Now, because we worry about filling up the octets of the outside atoms first, we're gonna end up in situations where the central atom did not get a filled octet. Well, in our case, this carbon says, well, I got two there, two there, two there, two there. That's a total of eight around me, and he's happy. And so the next thing you wanna do uh, after you fill up the outside atoms is you wanna to check to see if that central atom is happy, which really just means full. And normally it's gonna be filled octet if they're not one of the exceptions. And in this case, he is. And because that is the case, we are done. This is the structure for CCL4. Uh, and in this case, there are eight, again, shared electrons, and there are a whole boatload here. So we got uh, six here, six here, six here, six here, not, so uh, 24 total non-bonding electrons on those chlorines. So, but that is our Lewis dot structure. We're going to start off simple here. We are going to ramp this up and make this harder as we go. So next one we're going to take a look at is NF3. So I will also tell you that normally you're going to find out that the first element is going to be the one that's less electronegative uh, and is usually the one that's going to go in the middle. Uh, in this case, that's definitely the case here as well. Notice nitrogen is definitely less electronegative than fluorine, so we'll put the nitrogen in the middle. And in any three of the four directions, we've got to draw the fluorines. I could have put one of them up. I just randomly chose to go left, right, and down. My choice. All right, so before we get... Any further into this, let's just add up our valence electrons. And again, nitrogen, based on where he's at on the periodic table, has got five. And then each of the three fluorines has seven each. And seven times three is 21. Plus the five is going to get us up to 26 valence electrons. All right, so we got 26 to work with. Notice we've already used two, four, six. And once you've got your skeleton set up, then fill up the outside atoms first. So that's what we're going to do. Fill up those fluorines. Again, you will always have enough to fill up your outside atoms. Notice you could also look at this as worrying about filling up your more electronegative atoms first as well, because they're the outside ones. So electronegativity is, is something to do with you know, how, how much they like to pull electrons towards them. And so the ones that like the electrons the most, so to speak, are the ones we're giving the electrons to first, if you prefer to think of it that way. All right, so now we've got to take an accounting. Uh, we filled up those outside atoms, and the question is, do we have any electrons left? So two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, and eight times three is 24, and we've got electrons left. And if you fill up the outside atoms, and if you ever have any electrons left, they always go on the central atom, and you put them on in pairs. Well, we've got two electrons left out of those 26, and so we'll put them on the only side, there's no electrons on that nitrogen, and we'll put them on as a pair, and so in this case, we're now out of electrons. We've used all 26. And again, once you run out of electrons, you have to ask yourself, is the central atom happy, i.e. is the central atom full? And in this case, two, four, six, eight, that central atom is indeed full. He's got three pairs of bonding electrons and one lone pair of non-bonding electrons. So, and this is the structure of NF3. So nice filled octet for every atom. 
All right, next one on the list here is HCN. And when you don't have a binary uh, molecular compound, in but with more than two elements here, usually they actually put the one in the middle that goes in the middle. In that case, this is carbon. You could all say the least electronegative, but not hydrogen, is gonna go in the middle, and that's still carbon. And so we're gonna set up our skeleton here, like so. And we should count up our valence electrons. So hydrogen has just the one. Carbon's got the four and nitrogen's got five. And five plus four plus one is 10 valence electrons. And what we're gonna do is fill up the outside atoms first. And you might wanna start putting some electrons around the hydrogen. You might be inclined to start doing this. And then hopefully you realize pretty quickly that that's a bad idea. Hydrogen does not want a filled octet. If you recall, hydrogen just wants to look like helium and have two electrons. Well, before I drew any of those other dots, we already had two electrons. They're both bonding, but we had two electrons. Hydrogen's already full. No electrons to give to him. So we'll go to the other outside atom, the nitrogen, and we'll fill him up as well, because he's not yet full. So now he's full. And the question is, do we have any electrons left? Well, two, four, six, eight, ten. We've used them all. And so we're out of electrons, and the moment you run out of electrons, the question you have to ask yourself is, is the central atom happy? And in this case, carbon is not happy. He does not have a filled octet. He's not full. He's only got two, four electrons around him. He wants to have eight. And so, but again, we can't just put lone pairs on them because we've already used all 10 electrons. So we have to work with the electrons we have. And the way this works is somebody next to him is going to have to share some more electrons. And we're going to start forming. This is kind of uh, what happens when you uh, uh, get into this situation. You're gonna, this is when you have double and triple bonds. And so in this case, hydrogen doesn't have anything to share, but the nitrogen has these lone pairs that he could, instead of leaving them unshared, he could share them. And so we're going to take one of those there and turn it into a shared pair of electrons. And in this case, now the carbon says, well, now it's better, but it's still not perfect. I only got two, four, six electrons around me. So nitrogen says, okay, I'll share another pair since hydrogen's not got anything to share. And now the carbon's like much better because now he's got two, four, six, eight electrons around him. Nitrogen still has two, four, six, eight electrons around him. A lot more of them are shared than unshared in the original structure we had drawn. So, uh, but we're out of electrons, everybody's now got a filled octet or is full, as full as they wanna be, and this is the structure of HCN. So when you run out of electrons and your central atom's not happy, that's the evidence you're gonna start adding additional bonds, double or triple bonds to that central atom uh, from atoms that had lone pairs to share. Okay, so moving on to CO2 here. Let's just start with those valence electrons. So carbon's got four. Each of the two oxygens has six each. Six times two is 12, plus four is 16 valence electrons. Carbon's less electronegative, so we'll definitely put him in the middle. He can make more bonds. And then we'll fill up the octets of the outside atoms. So two, four, six, eight, ten. 12, and then 14, 16. So at this point, once we fill up the outside atoms, we've used all 16 of our valence electrons. So we're out. And the question we have to ask ourselves when we're out of electrons is, is the central atom happy, i.e., is that central atom full? And in this case, he is not. So uh, he's only got a total of four electrons. He'd like to have eight. We need somebody next to him to share. And in this case, it might not be intuitively obvious here, but there are three ways the sharing could happen here. So we could have, so to get him two more pairs of electrons, we could have the auction on the left do all the sharing. So we'll take away his two lone pairs and put a triple bond there. And so for those of you that uh, uh, might be a little OCD and be like, Chad, it's not symmetrical, don't do that. So again, we'll find out that symmetry is not the governing principle here. It turns out it'll work in this example, but it is not the governing principle though. So we'll go back to this structure yet again, because the other option would have been to have the auction on the right do all the sharing and put the triple bond over there. Well, finally, the other option would have been to have each of the oxygens sharing one pair each. And so we could take and erase a pair here, put in a double bond. So erase a pair here and put a double bond on the other side. Now, when you can draw multiple structures that get every atom a satisfied octet rule and stuff like this, we refer to this as resonance. Now, 
Now, normally we don't actually think of CO2 as exhibiting much resonance, and in, in truth, it, it really doesn't exhibit much at all. But if you can draw multiple structures that are not the same, uh, you do have a case that's called resonance. And if you've got resonance, it turns out you've got what we refer to as D localized electrons, electrons that are in more than one location at the same time. And so if I asked you, you know, what kind of bond is between carbon and oxygen? So, well, it turns out when you've got these resonance structures, it's some average of all these structures, uh, but some of the structures contribute more than others. And it turns out to find out how well they contribute, we have to worry about something called formal charge. So when formal charge is different, um, than oxidation state that we learned earlier in the semester. So, uh, and the way this works, uh, there's a couple different ways. You can learn the real formula and use it, but you're not likely to remember that six months from now, or you can kind of use a different formula. But the real formula says take the number of valence electrons for an atom and subtract half of its bonding electrons and all of its non-bonding electrons. So we apply this to say uh, oxygen over here in this structure. Oxygen's normal number of valence electrons is six based on where it is on the periodic table. So we'll start with that six and then we'll subtract half of his bonding electrons. Well, he's got one bond, that's two bonding electrons. Half of that would be just a one. So half of two is one. And then also all of his non-bonding electrons. And he's got six of those non-bonding electrons. And so we'll do six minus a total of one plus six, which is gonna get us to negative one. So again, it's the normal number of valence electrons minus half the bonding electrons and the non-bonding electrons. So the sum of all those. Cool, the way I like to look at this instead is I just take the normal number of valence electrons, six, minus the number of dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, and lines. Instead of looking at that as two bonding electrons, I'm now not looking at these as electrons at all, just dots and lines. And I have six dots and one line, six dots and one line. And so the normal valence of six minus the number of dots and lines is gonna get me that same negative one formal charge. And so oftentimes when you've got a formal charge like this, you'll write it up right next to the atom like so. If we do the same thing for carbon in the middle, so carbon's normal number of valence electrons is four, and carbon in this case has got four lines and no dots. And so four minus four, one, two, three, four, is zero, and he's got no formal charge, so we don't write anything in, just no formal charge. And then finally, for the other oxygen over here, again, the normal valence, uh, number of valence electrons for oxygen is six. Six minus two dots and three lines is gonna be plus one. So six minus one, two, three, four, five, and now we got plus one. And when it's just plus one or minus one, sometimes they'll just write plus and minus and not actually say plus one or minus one. But if you got a plus two or a minus two, you actually have to write the two in and stuff like that. So, but you could have also seen this simply written plus and minus, oftentimes circled, doesn't have to be circled. Cool, and that's one of the resonance structures. Had we looked at it for this one, we'd have found out it had been the oxygen on the left that was minus, and the one on the right was plus, and the carbon in the middle still no formal charge. But what we'll find on this last structure is that there are no formal charges. They're all zeros all the way across. So here for oxygen, six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, so four dots, two lines. Six minus six is zero. Same thing for the oxygen on the right, and for the carbon in the middle, four minus one, two, three, four lines is zero, and there's no formal charges. And so formal charges, there are some rules here, but when you've got different resonance structures for drawing out the Lewis dot structure of a molecule, the best one has the best formal charges. And by best formal charges, I put it on your hand out there, we want fewer formal charges. Well, this molecule has two different atoms with formal charges. This, and I should have said molecule, this resonance structure has two different atoms with formal charges, whereas this one doesn't have any atoms with formal charges. That's what makes him the best structure. So in fact, I think it's worth your time to memorize the Lewis structure for CO2. It shows up so commonly. You should still know how to derive this, but it shows up so commonly that if you've got it memorized, uh, it'll save you some time on your exam because it's very likely to show up in one way, shape, or form on your exam. 
Cool. But that's the best resonance structure. And so if you were asked to draw the Lewis structure for CO2, you really shouldn't draw these. They're going to ask you to draw this one. Now we'll find out in other cases that when you've got multiple structures you can draw and none is better than the others, something special is going to be implied about that. And I'll worry about that a little bit later, but we'll talk about resonance and delocalized electrons a little more when we get to that point. All right, so I told you this is gonna get progressively harder and harder, and if I wanted to ask you a question on an exam that I thought was sure to kinda of divide the A's from the B's, because uh, it's tricky and a lot of students will get it wrong, I might ask you something like, draw the Lewis structure for N2O. Uh, and it's tricky for two different reasons, as we'll see, so, uh, but definitely, you just wanna follow the rules, and as long as you follow the rules in order correctly, you're still gonna get the right answer. There's just some key places where uh, students really wanna not follow the rules, so. But we'll start with the number of valence electrons. The two nitrons each have five valence electrons. The oxygen's got six. So two times five is 10, plus six is 16 valence electrons. So, and a lot of students, here's where the first error. They're like, well, there's two nitrons, there's only one oxygen, so we'll put that oxygen in the middle. Well, if you recall, we said that the less electronegative atom goes in the middle, and nitrons less electronegative than oxygen. We also said that usually it's the one that's written first in a binary compound that goes in the middle. And so it turns out one of the nitrogens goes in the middle, not the oxygen. So there's the first common mistake students make is they don't follow the rules. And the rules say, put the less electronegative element in the middle, again, not hydrogen, uh, or again, that's the one that can make the most bonds and it's usually the first one listed in the compound. But again, it's just so tempting with only one oxygen and two nitrogens to put the oxygen in the middle. So because that's the pattern that's kind of been happening and so the pattern we're gonna uh, take back up right over here, but it's not the case here. Uh, from here, we will then fill up the octets of the outside atoms. And again, you'll always have enough to fill them up. Uh, and in this case, we've used 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. We've used all 16 of our electrons. We don't have any left. And the moment you run out of electrons, you have to ask yourself, is, is the central atom happy? And is our central atom full? Not at all. In this case, he's only got four electrons, just like we saw with CO2 in similar fashion. And so we need him to get four more electrons. We're gonna need to make two additional bonds. And so just like last time, there's really three ways we can pull this off. We can have the nitrogen on the left do all the sharing. So we'll have him form a triple bond. We could have had the oxygen on the right doing all the sharing as well. So we'll erase two of his lone pairs and make two additional bonds, a total of a triple bond to the oxygen. Or once again, we could have had, well, let's try and get that right. That's the nitrogen. We could have had both outer atoms do some sharing, which just seems fair and equitable, right? So we could have the nitrogen share one and form a double bond. We could have the oxygen share a pair and also form a double bond. And so the question is, which of these is the best? And again, if you're all about symmetry and OCD, like I tend to be, then this is probably the one you wanna choose. And unfortunately, it is not the best resonance structure. And I say resonance, and again, if you can draw multiple structures where everybody's getting this filled octet, you've got resonance going on. So, but this is again gonna be an example where there is one best resonance structure based again on formal charges. It, again, when you've got multiple resonance structures, it's formal charge that will help you distinguish th between them. All right, so if we look at this first one, so nitrogen's got uh, five valence electrons and five minus two dots and three lines. Five minus one, two, three, four, five is zero. For the central nitrogen, five minus one, two, three, four lines is plus one. And for oxygen, his normal valence is six. Six minus one line and six dots. So six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is negative one. Okay, so we got formal charges. In the next one for nitrogen here, so we got five is his normal valence. And so five minus one, two, three, four, five, six dots and one line. So five minus seven is negative two. And that's horrible, it turns out. And we'll keep going though. Uh, for the central nitrogen, five minus one, two, three, four lines is plus one. And then for the oxygen, six minus one, two, three lines at four, five, two dots. So six minus five, also plus one. Now, one thing you should realize is that the formal charges are always gonna add up to the overall charge on your compound or ion. Now, these, this is a neutral compound. Notice there's no charge listed right over here. And so the formal charges have to add up to zero, just like they do here and just like they do here. 
Now, we talked about some rules for getting the best formal charges. So, and the first rule is you want the fewest atoms with formal charges. Well, here I got two atoms with formal charges. Here I got three. This one's going to be better. We still got to worry about this last one. So, but we can already rule this one out. It's not, it's not as good. Now, the second rule deals with having formal charges closer to zero. Like negative one is better than negative two. So this is gonna get ruled out again by that rule. And then we'll find out if you still haven't distinguished between your resonance structures, then if you've got a difference of where the, which atom gets the negative charge, always put it on the more electronegative atom to get to the major resonance contributor, we call it the best resonance structure. So, but so far, this one's out, the top one's winning so far. And if we go assign formal charges to this bottom one now, that again, symmetrically just looks so good. Uh, nitrogen's only got five valence electrons, minus one, two, three, four, five, six. Five minus six is negative one. For the central nitrogen here, five again, minus one, two, three, four is plus one. And then oxygen's normal number of valence electrons is six. Six minus one, two, three, four, five, six is zero. And he's got no formal charge. And so now we see these two, and the first rule for distinguishing resonant structures based on formal charges, the fewer formal charges. Well, they both have two atoms with formal charges each, no difference. So then you wanna say, uh, you want formal charges that are closer to zero. Well, we have plus one and minus one, plus one and minus one, and there's still no difference. And this is what makes this last one doubly tricky, is now it's distinguishing between these uh, resonant structures, again, using formal charge, not using symmetry, it's using formal charge. And the last rule says that if the first two rules didn't work, then it's going to come down to which atom gets the negative charge. And in this case, the, the first one, the negative charge is on the oxygen, whereas in the last one, the negative charge is on the nitrogen on the left. Notice in both structures, that central nitrogen gets a positive formal charge. There's no difference in that regard. It's all about where the negative formal charge goes. And do we want it on the oxygen or do we want it on the nitrogen? Well, again, the best place to put a negative formal charge is on the more electronegative atom. And in this case, oxygen's more electronegative than nitrogen. And so it turns out this first one is actually your major resonance contributor. And so, uh, when you've got these resonant structures, it turns out that none of these structures is perfectly correct, is usually the way this works. What the molecule would really look like would be some average of the structures, but it would look more like this one than it would look like either one of these. And it would probably look more like this one than it would like this one, because this is a little better than this one and stuff. But what, you, what that means then in this case is that you're probably gonna have a significant amount of negative charge on this oxygen, since this is the best resonant structure. Notice in, the, in this resonant structure, there's no charge. And in this one, it's positive charge, but in the best one, it's a negative charge. And so there's probably gonna be a fair amount of negative uh, on that oxygen. So, and in all the resonant structures, there's a positive charge on the central nitrogen. So there's just gonna be a positive charge on that nitrogen. And then finally, in, in the, the, the nitrogen on the left, it's either neutral or it's negative two or it's negative one. Well, in the best structure, it's neutral. So it's probably gonna have a very small amount of partial negative due to the contributions of these guys, but it's gonna be closer to neutral than it is to gonna be either negative one or negative two. So uh, that's the way this works uh, in terms of, uh, uh, delocalization here. And so uh, delocalization means the electrons can be in multiple locations at the same time. And so if you notice the extra bonds that we have, well, they're mostly between the two nitrogens, but they could be a little bit between the nitrogen and the oxygen according to these two structures as well. And so it turns out they're partially in both the locations at the same time. And that's really frustrating. But again, in this example, Again, it mostly, the, the resonance hybrid, we say, is gonna mostly resemble this particular structure rather than the other two. We'll get to an example with equivalent resonance structures in a little bit, and again, we'll have to do something a little special for that. Okay, next one on the list here is SF4, and we're gonna find out this is our example, our first example of an expanded octet. And there's nothing you can look at this that's just gonna be like, it's an expanded octet. Now, it turns out the least electronegative atom is the sulfur. And sulfur is in the third row of the periodic table or lower, so it's allowed to go over the octet rule, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna have to go over the octet rule. Well, we'll find out that when you've got one of these atoms uh, in the third row or lower, the only chance it has of going over the octet rule is if it's the central atom. But again, there's no guarantee there either. Even when it's the central atom, it doesn't have to go over the octet rule. But if you follow the rules, it will naturally work out to either go over the octet rule or not, as we'll see. All right, so sulfur's got six valence electrons being right below oxygen, and then each of the fluorines has seven each, so four times seven is 28, plus six is 34 valence electrons. 
And again, sulfur is less electronegative, so we'll put him in the middle and surround him with four fluorines. Cool, next thing you do is fill up the outside atoms, which are more electronegative, and so, and again, you'll always have enough electrons to just fill them up, so don't even have to count, you just start filling this up. And now we have to take an accounting though. Any electrons left over at this point would always go on the central atom. Uh, and in this case, we've used up two, four, six, eight, eight around this one, eight around each of the four fluorines if you look at it. So eight, 16, 24, 32, we've got two electrons left. And if you have filled up the outside atoms and you still have electrons left over, they always go on the central atom and in pairs as well. And so in this case, we've got two electrons left. It has to go on the central atom. That's where they go. That's what the rules say. And they go on as a pair. And so you have to actually put them on one of the diagonals here. And you see that this means that sulfur now has not just eight electrons, but two, four, six, eight, ten electrons around him. And we're out of electrons. We've, we've used all 34. And usually this would be the point where we'd say, is the central atom happy? Well, in this case, sulfur is more than happy. He is drunk with electrons. He's not just full. He's more than full. He's got 10. And that's okay because he's in the third row of the periodic table or lower. He's allowed to exceed that octet rule. And he doesn't have to, but if you follow the rules and he does, no problem with that. Now, one thing you should do when you've got a, an expanded octet like this is you should just check your formal charges real quick. Uh, and most of the time, you're probably not going to end up with any formal charges. But what you'll find out is that if you've got uh, some of the outside atoms being negative and the central atom being positive, you could actually probably reduce your formal charges by forming a double bond and possibly more than one from the outside atoms. But again, it's only going to be the case if you have a negative formal charge atom on the outside bonded to the central atom with a positive formal charge. But in this case, if we look at those fluorines, uh, normal valence is seven minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is no formal charge on any of the fluorines. And then for sulfur, his normal valence is six. And so six minus one, two, three, four, five, six is zero as well. And so no formal charges. There's no better structure than this. There's no other structure than this, it turns out as well. This is the correct Lewis structure for SF4, our first example of an expanded octet. All right, next one on the list is special, a little unusual. It has a noble gas in it, xenon in this case. And you recall the, the noble gases are known for being chemically inert. They hardly ever do anything chemically. And the only chance we talked about, we briefly mentioned that uh, they can when they're bonded to something very electronegative for some of the larger noble gases and fluorines as electronegative as they come. And so this is one of the few compounds uh, that we can form using one of these noble gases. Well, if you've got a noble gas in your compound, I'll tell you right off the bat, it's going to be the central atom. And so in this case, xenon's gonna go in the middle and be bonded to four fluorines. So, and if you've got a, a a noble gas that already had a filled octet and now he's going to make bonds, then he's going to exceed the octet rule. So this is definitely expanded octet. If you've got a noble gas involved in any molecule, it will be an expanded octet. Uh, if we count up our electrons, xenon's got eight. Each of the four fluorines has seven. Four times seven is 28 plus eight is 36. And we'll do the same rules though. We're just going to follow the rules. We set up our skeleton and we are just going to fill up the outside atoms next. And again, you'll always have enough to just fill them up. So just do it indiscriminately. Cool. And at this point, we've used 8, 16, 24, 32. We have four electrons left. And once you fill up the outside, if you have any electrons left over, they always go on the central atom in pairs. And since we got four left, that means we've got to add two pairs. And you just got to put them on two of the diagonals. And it's customary to put them on opposite diagonals as if they're like repelling each other. And we'll find out uh, in, in the next chapter when we talk about molecular geometry, how that kind of is an, an accurate, a little more accurate portrayal of reality than putting them right next to each other. But technically there's nothing wrong with putting them right next to each other. So, but we'll find out that when we do actually try to draw the three-dimensional shape that there really will be 180 degrees apart. Cool. Uh, at this point, once you run out of electrons, you always ask yourself is, is the central atom happy? And again, Xenon's more than happy here. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve electrons, more than a filled octet, drunk with electrons, super happy, and nothing wrong with it because he's, he's definitely in the third row, or in this case, lower, uh, and is allowed to have that expanded octet. Cool, we should really quickly assign formal charges just to make sure there's nothing else special within any, any expanded octet. And in this case, uh, the fluorines, again, seven is the normal valence, seven minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is zero. 
And for Xenon, he already had a filled octet. Eight is his normal valence. And so eight minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, also zero. With no formal charges, there's nothing to do to doctor up this structure. This is the correct Lewis structure for XeF4. All right, so SO4 two minus is the next one. And this is the first example where we've seen an ion. And when you've got an ion, if it's an anion, you have to add extra electrons. If it's negative one, add one extra electron. If it's negative two, add two extra electrons, and so on and so forth. If it's a cation, you actually remove electrons. Plus one, you remove one electron. Plus two, you lose two electrons, so on and so forth. Uh, so in this case, when we go to add up the electrons, sulfur's got six valence electrons. Each of the four oxygens has six each as well, and four times six is 24, plus another six for sulfur is 30. And since it's negative two, we have to add two additional electrons for a total of 32. Cool, so that's how we account for that negative charge. And we're gonna put the less electronegative atom in the middle, which is sulfur in this case. Notice oxygen is the second most electronegative on the periodic table after fluorine, so it's definitely sulfur that's less electronegative. And first thing we'll do is fill up those outside atoms. All right, so once they are full, we'll see if we have any electrons left. And in this case, uh, again, we've got eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, and that's eight, 16, 24, 32. We have used all 32 electrons. So the question we might ask ourselves then is, once you're out of electrons, is the central atom happy? And in this case, this sulfur has got two, four, six, eight. He's got a filled octet. He is happy. And again, uh, we do have sulfur in the center though. And notice sulfur, how many bonds would you normally expect to see sulfur making? Well, normally he's just two electrons short of a filled octet. We normally expected to see him making just two bonds. Well, he's making four. So, and oftentimes when you've got an element that's third row of the periodic table or lower, and it's not making its normal number of bonds, it, it also means that an expanded octet might be possible or even probable in your structure. Uh, and so in this case, we're actually gonna go through and assign our formal charges as well. Uh, for the oxygens on the outside, again, normal valence uh, number is six valence electrons. So six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So six dots in one line. So six minus seven is negative one. And they're all gonna come out with that same calculation. And then for the sulfur in the middle, his normal number of valence electrons is also six. So six minus one, two, three, four lines. So six minus four would be plus two. And so not the greatest structure in the world, truth be told. We got five atoms with formal charges and we even have a plus two, which is so far from zero and stuff like this. Uh, and if you recall, I also said, if you've got an atom who can have an expanded octet in the middle and he's got a positive formal charge of some sort and the ones next to him on the outside have a negative formal charge, well, you can actually reduce your formal charges by having the negatives donate and share electrons with the positive. And so that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna take say the auction on the right here, we're gonna race one of his lone pairs and have them be a shared pair with sulfur. And you'll see what we accomplish with this. So uh, in this case, if we look at this auction now, now they shared some electrons, uh, his normal valence number is six again, and six minus one, two, three, four, five, six is now zero. He no longer has a formal charge. And for the sulfur here, his normal valence number is also six, and six minus one, two, three, four, five is now only plus one. And so by having one of those negative atoms on the outside share with the positive central atom, we reduced our formal charges. One of the oxygens went from negative to now having no formal charge, and the sulfur went from plus two to plus one, both of which are improvements on the structure. So since he's still plus one though, we could do this again to get him to neutral. Uh, and so in this case, any one of the other three we can choose, and it's customary to kind of choose the opposite one, but there's nothing incorrect about choosing a different one, it turns out. But we will share again, and that's gonna make the oxygen on the left now have no formal charge, and it'll make the sulfur now also have no formal charge. Again, sulfur's normal valence is six. Six minus one, two, three, four, five, six is zero. And now we've reduced the formal charges. Now, in this case, if we had either one of these oxygens do any more sharing, it would actually start giving the sulfur a negative formal charge, and we don't wanna go that far. So you only wanna kinda of take this approach when you can reduce your formal charges. So in this case, if I, uh, let's say we do it, let's just do it, and we'll undo it in a second. So if I make and have one of this, this oxygen do some sharing as well, 
What we'll find out is that this oxygen now would no longer have a formal charge, but the sulfur in the middle would have a formal charge. And this is not a better structure because in the previous structure, I had the negative formal charge on the more electronegative oxygen. Now I have the negative formal charge on the less electronegative sulfur, and I'd much rather have it on the more electronegative oxygen. So we were done, it turns out, with this as the best possible resonance contributor here. And again, two oxygens have negative formal charges, but the other three atoms have no formal charges. Uh, when you've got an ion, by the way, it's also customary to put the entire Lewis structure in brackets and then to put its charge in the upper right hand side. And so for an ion here, uh, we'll put it in brackets and put that charge. We'll find out there's one other case where we might use these brackets uh, as well uh, in the next example. One other thing to note, sometimes this happens when we could have an expanded octet or not. And if you recall, we had, before we got this far, We had negative formal charges on all the oxygens and a plus two charge on the sulfur. And again, this was the superior structure. It had fewer formal charges, yeah, fewer formal charges, formal charges that are closer to zero, uh, the whole bit. So however, sometimes a question might be asked in such a way for something where this expanded octet is possible for that central atom uh, that might just say, draw the best structure for SO4 two minus where every atom satisfies the octet rule. Well, notice again, our central atom here is totally exceeding the octet rule. But back in this structure, every atom is satisfying the octet rule. It's not the best one based on formal charge, which is typically the, the, the most important criteria. But if your instructions were to draw the best Lewis structure where everybody has a filled octet, well, then that would be the one. And again, it wouldn't be the best overall structure, but it would be the one where every atom has a filled octet. All right, so last one we're going to take a look at here is NO3 minus. And NO3 minus, first thing we should do is figure out how many valence electrons we've got. Nitrogen's got five. Each of the oxygens has six each, so it's three times six is 18, plus five is 23. And because we have a negative one charge, we add one extra to get to 24. And in this case, nitrogen's less electronegative and goes in the middle. So we've got our skeleton set up and then we'll fill up the outside atoms. Once we got them full, we now have to take an accounting. When we've used eight, 16, 24 electrons. We only had 24 electrons, and so we're out. And once we're out, we have to ask ourselves, is the central atom happy? Is the central atom full? And in this case, he's not. He's just got two, four, six electrons around him. He needs one more pair, so he needs somebody next to him who has a lone pair to share it with him and form a double bond. Well, how many options do we have? Well, we have three options. And in this case, it's not like one's a nitrogen, one's an oxygen, like we saw with N2O or something like that. They're all oxygens, they're all equivalent. And as a result, if I just need any one of them to share and form a double bond, well then any one of them could. And we actually have three st equivalent structures to draw. So I could have it be the oxygen on the left, and we draw that structure. We could have had it be the oxygen in the middle, And in this case, I erased a lone pair essentially effectively that was here and made it a double bond. Or it could have been the oxygen on the right that did the extra sharing. And so it leaves us with these three structures. And again, when you've got multiple structures you can draw, we call them resonance structures, and you usually will use formal charge to distinguish between them. Well, I'm gonna take it for granted that you guys know how to uh, uh, go about and, and uh, do formal charges now. So I'm gonna just write some in. I wanna get lost uh, in the trees here. So, but it turns out for this auction, six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is negative one. Same for this one, this one's neutral. And then for nitrogen, five minus one, two, three, four is plus one. And what you're going to find is that for all three structures, the nitrogen's got a positive formal charge. And then two of the oxygens are going to have a negative formal charge. And if we look at this then, formal charge is not going to help us distinguish between these three resonant structures. They all have three atoms with formal charges and they're all 
uh, with a plus one formal charge on nitrogen and two of the oxygens having minus one formal charges. They're equivalent in every respect. And so instead of having like one major resonance contributor, which would be the, you know, if you're asked to draw a Lewis structure, if you've got resonance, but there's one major resonance contributor, that's typically what they want you to draw. But in this case, they're all equivalent. And so you're not gonna be able to get away with just drawing the best one. In this case, they actually want you to draw all of them as a proper Lewis structure. And so what they want you to do when you've got equivalent resonance structures like this is draw them all out and then put an arrow, a double-headed arrow like this. Notice don't do this. That is it got a different meaning in chemistry, so it's gotta be a double-headed arrow like that guy. And put it in between each of the structures and then put them all in brackets. Now, in this case, we would have put these in brackets anyways because it's an ion with a charge. So there, it turns out there's two reasons to use brackets, either because you're doing the Lewis structure for an ion that has a charge, or if you've got multiple equivalent resonance structures like we do here. Well, in this case, either reason would have led us to use brackets here, and we still need to put that negative one charge right here. You either write negative or negative one, either one is correct. Okay, so in this case, we have resonance, and this is where things get a little bit weird. So, and you need to understand what resonance means. And again, resonance always implies delocalized electrons. And I mentioned that earlier, but I didn't explain it because it's gonna make the most sense in this example. Now, we say it means delocalized electrons, and here's the deal. None, not one of these three structures is an accurate depiction of reality. None of them really exist. Uh, the real molecule, it turns out, is an average, some sort of average of all these structures at the same time. But we try to confuse you by putting these double-headed arrows and using the word resonance, because if we use that word resonance, then you might also try to use the word resonating. And then we put this double arrow, and it makes you think, well, maybe it's resonating back and forth. Maybe if I took a photo of this molecule with an electron microscope or something, at one moment in time, maybe it looks like this. And so you had a double bond over here, and two single bonds over here. And then maybe if you take you know, a photograph of it again a couple seconds later, now the double bond's down over here and these are the single bonds. And then if you took a, a, another photograph a, a, you know, a second later, now the double bond's on the right and these are single bonds. And one thing you should realize is that a double bond is stronger than a single bond and a triple bond is stronger than a double bond when it's between the same two atoms. And when you have a, a stronger bond between the same two atoms, it actually ends up being a shorter bond. They're pulled closer together. And so by saying we have a double bond here and two single bonds here, we're actually saying that we have one short bond and two longer bonds. So again, one short bond and two longer bonds. One short bond and two longer bonds. So but unfortunately, when we actually look at the structure of NO3 minus here, we actually find that all three bonds are exactly the same length all the time. It's not like you look at it and which one's the short one right now? No, it turns out they're all the same length all the time. And that is super frustrating. So it turns out that none of these structures actually give an accurate depiction of what the molecule looks like at any moment ever. What the molecule looks like all the time though is the average of all these structures. And so we draw what's called the resonance hybrid. And so it turns out that, you know, here we've got a double bond, but here it's a single and here it's a single. Well, what we end up having is an extra partial bond. So it's not a double bond, but it's more than a single bond. It's somewhere in between a single and a double bond. And it turns out, it's if we actually measure its length and stuff like that, it's a little bit shorter than a single bond, but a little bit longer than a double bond. And so we find out it's intermediate in both strength and the length between a single and a double bond. And same thing for this one right here. It's a double in this structure, but it's a single in the other two. And so it's a partial double bond right there as well. And then same thing for the one on the right. Single here, single here, but double here. And so it's a partial. And so it turns out that all three bonds are exactly the same length, exactly the same strength, and they're stronger than a single bond, but weaker than a double bond. And if you actually look at any one structure, you can say, well, between all three oxygens, you have a total of one, two, three, four bonds spread across three locations. And four bonds over three locations is four thirds of a bond. And so these are really like one and one third bonds. And so they're like 33% stronger, a third stronger than a single bond, uh, essentially is how that works, and therefore a third shorter on average-ish than a single bond as well. Cool, so you should understand that when we've got these equivalent resonance structures, 
proper way to draw the Lewis structure out is draw all of them in brackets with these lovely double-headed arrows between the structures. You should know that it, none of these structures is correct, that what we really have again is this resonance hybrid. I'll draw that out. So you might get a multiple choice question that just shows which of these, you know, represents the resonance hybrid or something like that. So you might also have to figure out, you know, how strong is that bond? Like it's a four third bond, a one and one third bond in this example. And again, we just figured that out by taking, you know, our structures and saying there's one, two, three, four bonds shared across three locations evenly. Okay. You could have also looked at it this way and said, double here, single here, single here. And if you take, you know, the average of double, single, and single, well, you're like double, single, and single is four and then divide by three structures, you still get four thirds of a bond. You can get it that way as well, technically. All right, notice also in this resonance uh, hybrid here, I have refrained from drawing charges, but what we can do is say that the, the nitrogen in the middle is fully positively charged. So, but it turns out the oxygens, in this structure, this oxygen has no formal charge. In these structures, it's minus one. What's the average of zero, minus one, and minus one? Well, we'd say minus one plus minus one plus zero is minus two, and then that's averaged across three structures, so it's minus two-thirds. Well, we don't usually draw the fractions in, so what we usually do is use this symbol to mean partial, and it's got a partial negative charge. And they all essentially have this partial negative charge, which we just figured out was a negative two-thirds of a charge. And uh, we've seen this once before, but this is... Uh, the lowercase Greek letter delta, and we use it for like partial derivatives, like dy dx, uh, uh, but instead of the d with partial derivatives, we use the delta instead, but it just means partial. And so partially negative on all three oxygens, and that is our resonance hybrid. This is what the molecule looks like all the time. Again, if, if you're asked to draw a proper Lewis structure, you draw all three of these. If you're asked what does the resonance hybrid look like, well, it looks like this. And so this extra partial bond, it's one extra bond shared in all three locations, it is simultaneously in all three locations. And that's what we mean by delocalized electrons. So again, delocalized just means in multiple locations at the same time. And we don't have you know, anything on the macro world that really works like this, but for these electrons, they can be in three different bonding locations at the same time. So, and that's what that dashed line represents. Cool, we have pretty much covered just about every uh, nuance of drawing Lewis structures you could possibly see. And I recommend you get some good practice at this and you get fast at it before your exam. It's gonna be super important. Usually this is taught uh, uh, in the same unit as molecular shapes, uh, which will come in the next chapter. And unfortunately, <laughs> to be able to properly assign molecular shapes, you have to be able to properly draw Lewis structures first. So this is gonna be important uh, for itself, but also important because uh, it's gonna be foundational for the next chapter as well. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider hitting that like button? Best thing you can do to make sure YouTube shares this lesson with other students as well. And if you're looking for practice on Lewis dot structures or anything general chemistry related, check out my general chemistry master course. I'll leave a link in the description. Free trials available. Happy studying.